the scene, I want you to take a look at some of the video that photographer Mario Vasquez took, a, took just moments ago. Thomas then shot Trey Marshall in the back. Trey then fell to the ground right here, tried to call for help, and that's when Thomas shot him four more times. The lighter areas are hotter spots on my body and the darker areas are cooler spots. Now we're going to use this camera to show you how quickly heat moves out of the body. The cameras are on the chest of the officer and start recording when they're out on a call. This is the point of view that is recorded. One of our babies, one of our kids. Parents are here for all the wrong reasons. 17, gone. Too soon. They said a kid is not supposed to go before their mother. This morning, I was just laying in his room and I was like, uh, my son's not walking through the door no more. My son, every time he gets off the phone with me, no matter what he says, I love you, mom. Every time. Travion Marshall's mom joins others in the worst kind of club after two years of high profile violence targeting young men. Tevin Nelson in 2011. DeAndre Johnson last March, Brian Rankin last April, now Travion, some still in high school, all gone in an instant, gunned down. I don't want no mama to get the phone call I got. Speak now. No mama, no, no mama. You know, my knees gave out. You could come up to him, he, he wasn't like a meanie or anything like that. Uh, like he was always a prankster and I always liked to joke around. All I did. Let's try to take care of my baby the best way I knew how to take care of my baby. And on this hot, humid summer evening, parents aren't here so their kids can play. They're here to remember a victim who was but a kid himself. So I just want to say to my baby, Travion Jermaine Marshall, as goofy as that thing, make you laugh. I love you, baby. In Columbia, Evan Miller to ABC 17 News. There's not a day or an hour that goes by that you don't think about Bruce, that I don't think about Bruce. It's hard to comprehend that he's not here and that he's gone. The words of Columbia firefighter Weston Enix seem to reflect those who knew and worked closely with Bruce Britt. At Columbia Fire Station 4, where Lieutenant Britt once called home, there's a sapling planted in his memory. Our crew and then the crew that was with Bruce the morning that he uh, that the accident happened and we all planted it together. The growing tree is only one of many tributes to the fallen firefighter. So the sticker's on the side right there in the window and it's also talking it also has the name of the other firefighter we had die in the line of duty. You know it gives us some something to remember Bruce by. There's a plaque downtown that has uh, has his name and stuff on it on the front of the building along with Hector Crum and you know just reminding of the sacrifice that they both made. When we imagine a fallen firefighter we think of a tragedy involving a hero fighting through a raging inferno not dying in an unexpected balcony collapse on a sunny Saturday morning. As a company officer Bruce was a lieutenant uh, and as a company officer it it makes you think differently about you know the situations you approach but you can't go into the stuff that we go into and, and second guess yourself. Uh, 
Bruce wouldn't do that and, and he wouldn't want any of us to do it either on his account. So um, in the back of your mind, there's some things that, that you know, we think about, especially when we approach a walkway or something like that, uh, you know, that, uh, that happened to him. But ultimately, you know, we have to trust our instincts and do the job that we're here to do. None of the officers or firefighters on our department or probably any department would have done anything different than Bruce did that, that morning. Uh, so, you know, our training is, is really good anyway, but uh, we've just tried to think about things a little more maybe before we, uh, you know, enter into an unknown situation. And uh, just like I said earlier, it's probably in the back of the everyone's mind just a little bit more so your, your general awareness of, of things are higher. And ultimately that, that probably helps us. Another person who says Lieutenant Brett helped is Peyton Bolden, who was just a young child when Bruce Brett became his second father. Oh, at the time, you know, I was, I was, it was confusing because my dad was getting remarried, my mom got remarried, you know, like any, any 10 year old, you're kind of confused, but, but uh, Bruce and I always really got along good. He was, a, he was, he took care of me. Yeah. And uh, that, at that time, that's what I needed, so. He was as much a dad to me as, as, uh, as anybody. I mean, I'm not taking anything from my dad, but he, he, he accepted me for, for, for who I was and, and took me in and did a lot of things for me. When you heard of what happened mm -hmm. last year, uh, what was the first thing you thought of? Uh, um, honestly, I thought it was a joke. Uh, a buddy of mine called me and uh, he said Bruce is, has died and uh, it didn't set in at all and uh, we were I was just sitting at the counter that morning and he said Peyton this is for real he said Bruce passed away this morning and I didn't know what else to do so I started calling everybody that was a part of our life um, a lot of really close friends and I wanted everybody to, to, to hear that, that he had passed. It was very tough for me that day and has been ever since. You know, uh, it's getting close to when he passed away and been a lot of pictures coming back up, m memories, and it's hard. But uh, um, Bruce passed away doing what he loved and protecting everybody. I've got married in last year and got a little boy and Ra was born in April and uh, Bruce died in February and you know, we just, uh, I just wish Bruce would have got to meet him. Uh, that's one thing I, I do wish, that Bruce would have got to see Ryle, because he was, you never seen anybody so excited when I told him he was going to be a grandpa. So, he knew he was a boy. Ryle's definitely got somebody watching over him up, up top now. 29 Missouri men and women have walked free from prison since 1991. Most were never supposed to see outside the prison walls again. Courts in this state are releasing prisoners at higher rates now than at any other time in recent history. Last week, Ryan Ferguson became the sixth man released early from a state prison this year. From wrongly convicted they get to cause celeb. I feel like Jay Leno or something. Ryan Ferguson is now a member of a small but growing group in Missouri. You are looking at faces of people who, until this year, still face decades behind bars. George Allen Jr., Reginald Griffin, Paula Hall, Robert Nelson, Mark Woodworth, Ryan Ferguson. You know, this is not an anomaly. I think we need to look at other cases and be aware that this is part of our justice system and, you know, there are more innocent people in prison. I think that people think that these cases are just um, anomalies, that they just happen once in a blue moon. Laura O'Sullivan teaches at UMKC's law school in Kansas City. She shepherds students through wrongful conviction cases and theory. One of the very first things I tell them is when you look at these cases initially, you're going to think that they look guilty because oftentimes 12 jurors listened to the case and thought they looked guilty. What we're finding out is it's a much bigger problem than, than we ever imagined. And if it's a problem, it's becoming a more common one. Take a look at this chart. In 1989, 20 people nationwide walked free. So far this year, the numbers ballooned to 77. 
But why? O'Sullivan says researchers look at a few reasons, including official misconduct, false confessions, faulty informant and eyewitness testimony, and bad science. I think because of the better technology, we're able to also get to information and evidence that will help us reveal the um, the injustices that have occurred. We're tracking them now, so um, I think that that certainly helps us figure out how big this problem is. And this is one of the tools tracking wrongful convictions. The National Registry of Exonerations is run by Michigan and Northwestern law schools. On these pages, you'll find summaries of the cases that never should have been. On Missouri's page, you'll now find Ryan Ferguson. You'll also find Joshua Kieser. It is necessary. We're talking about innocent lives. We're, this isn't a numbers game. These aren't animals. This isn't uh, throwaway material. This is human life. Geezer was exonerated in 2009 after spending 15 years in prison for a Southeast Missouri murder he says he didn't commit. Now the Scott County Sheriff agrees with him. Keezer talked to us the day Ferguson's conviction was vacated. Well, it's a shock the day that it comes um, because you know it's going to come, but you don't know when, you don't know how, you don't know through what um, circumstance or you know what motion or something of that nature. Since gaining freedom, Keezer has been outspoken about helping others do the same. One of the first people he named, Ryan Ferguson. And last week, we heard Ferguson name another. Charles Erickson. I mean, the guy's a lot of things, but the, the thing he is more so than anything else is innocent. We know that Charles Erickson is innocent. We know that. Laura O'Sullivan is also the senior counsel for the Midwest Innocence Project, but let's add a third title for her, attorney for Charles Erickson. We're only halfway there. 50% justice is not justice enough. She knows it's a long road ahead. Erickson has a particularly difficult task here because there is no magic DNA that's going to exonerate him. O'Sullivan's last client, Robert Nelson, was released this year after nearly 30 years in prison. George Allen got out this year after two decades. Joshua Kieser served 15 years. Ryan Ferguson had been in for eight. When these cases come up and we start looking at them and realizing something went wrong here, we all need to just admit it, accept it, and do what needs to be done to get them out of there in a timely manner. The requirement that people um, you know, go through lengthy appellate processes um, while, while people are fighting. That's frustrating. The Midwest Innocence Project is pushing for a streamlined appeals process, and the Missouri Association of Prosecuting Attorneys says it's always reviewing best practices. In response to our story, President Matt Selby issued this statement, saying, quote, the conviction of an innocent person is every prosecutor's worst nightmare. The rules of the Missouri Supreme Court give prosecutors more ethical duties than any other attorneys. He also points out despite how the exoneration registry looks, wrongful convictions happen in about 1 in 25,000. That is 0.004% of the time.